I request all the participants to mute your mic and turn off your uh, videos to let smoothly run this lecture. I would also request all the participants to kindly write their questions in the chat box. We'll have a question answer session at the end of this lecture. As already introduced in, uh, in our last lecture series about the objectives of the Holkar Cultural Center, I would like to say a few words about it for all who have missed our last lecture. The Holkar Cultural Center in Maheshwar is an initiative by the Royal Holkar family to research, document, and create a vibrant dialogue around 300 years of Holkar history and Maratha culture. The Holkar Cultural Center has two areas of focus, broadly defined as cultural heritage, covering Holkar history, culture, and tradition, and built heritage, which covers the extensive portfolio uh, of beautiful and historic structures built and restored by the Holkars, most notably Devi Ahilya by Holkar. This lecture is about the built heritage, which, which will focus on the restoration of Lal Bagh Palace, Indore, by the principal conservation architect, Abha Narayan Lamba, um, and his team, art conservator Anupam, and director, ANLA, Krishna Ayer. I would uh, now like to invite Prish Prince Yashwantra Holkar to share a few words on today's session. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Supriya. Um, so it is uh, a great uh, delight to welcome Abha and her team uh, and all of our audience today to today's session. Um, I uh, must say I've been following the uh, restoration of Lal Bagh eagerly for since the start of the uh, the project when uh, Amita Beg of the World Monument Fund let me know it, uh, it was happening and. And on a personal note, you know, to see Lal Bagh um, over the years, having uh, slowly lost some of its um, grandeur, uh, to now have a chance to re uh, to be reborn uh, and reconstituted in such a, um, a meticulous and uh, a detailed fashion, it's really wonderful. Um, and I've had the distinct pleasure of going around. Um, with, uh, with the World Monument Fund team, with ABBA at the site and seeing uh, the work that has been done. And, and I must say, no, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's a difficult project to, to take on uh, a sort of uh, Italian Renaissance revival um, uh, palace like this, which has so many uh, important and fine details uh, from uh, the ornaments on the walls to the tapestries to the fabrics and the detail to which Abba and her team have have um, have gone to bring in the world's experts in these in these items um, uh, really shows the commitment of the team, the commitment of the Madhya Pradesh government, and the commitment of the World Monument Fund to achieving a world class restoration. So, uh, on behalf of the family. Uh, thank you very much for taking on this project, for bringing back uh, something to Indore, which is iconic, which uh, I do hope will become a center for culture, a uh, center for people to gather, uh, whether it's for a morning walk or for an exhibition or for um, uh, just something to re, uh, reconnect with Indore's past. It'll really become a landmark for the city. Uh, so on behalf of the family, on behalf of Indore's, Thank you so much. And we very much look forward to hearing more about the project and, and to, its, uh, uh, to its completion. Thank you. Before uh, starting the presentation, I would like to um, introduce Abba Ma'am uh, uh, as a guest speaker this evening. So uh, basically, Abha Narayan Lamba is a conservation architect with 25 years of expertise in this field. She pursued a master's in architectural conservation from School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi. She is the principal architect and founder of the firm Abha Narayan Lamba Associates. Her firm has been awarded with 10 UNESCO Asia Pacific Awards for con heritage conservation projects. She has been a consultant to ICROM, UNITAR, World Monuments Fund, Global Heritage Fund, Archaeological Survey of India, and has served on the heritage committees of both Delhi and Mumbai. Her firm's area of special specialization includes architectural conservation, building restoration and retrofit, designing for museums and memorials, historic interiors, 
uh, preparation of UNESCO World Heritage Site nomination dossiers and management plans, UNESCO audit uh, reports, preparation of urban and regional level conservation management plans, conservation assessment studies, urban signage and street furnitures, and so on. <laughs> Uh, so uh, today she is here with us to share some of her restoring Lal Bagh Palace experience. Good evening. It's uh, an absolute honor to be part of this uh, this uh, event, and I'm very grateful to the Holkar Cultural Center and especially to Yashwan uh, for organizing this. Uh, well, this undoubtedly Lal Bagh Palace is the finest when it comes to period uh, French interiors, and you know having worked. Uh, in you know uh, on the Chomahala Palace and then Jevelas Palace, uh, to be able to work on, on on a historic building like this is absolutely a privilege and an honor. Uh, and this project would not have happened had it not been for a unique partnership, a collaboration, and a you know uh, between the government of Madhya Pradesh and the World Monuments Fund. Uh, so it was some years ago when uh, the government of Madhya Pradesh approached uh, and, and the World Monuments Fund decided to take on the work of the Lal Bagh project. And I was approached uh, to take uh, on this really uh, daunting task to bring back uh, such a historic building uh, back to life. Uh, so if we, we look at the history of the Lal Bagh Palace, it's inextricably linked to the history of the Holkar uh, rulers. And uh, we've, the building itself, if you see this plan, was built over two generations and over two time periods in a way. The first phase, uh, which was built earlier, uh, was built under the, uh, in the rule of Tukujirao Holkar II. And its period, uh, you know, this was built during his reign, which was between 1850 and 1886. And after that, the second phase was built in the reign of Shivaji Rao Holkar. And this really <laughs> together, both these, the, these layers uh, create one of the finest specimens of uh, Royal Indian palaces that we have extant today. This, uh, when the project was was uh, in, you know, envisioned as part of uh, the World Monuments Fund team, uh, we realized that there's so many layers and complexities to this project that we can't uh, you know, just jump in without a very detailed conservation assessment. And uh, so the conservation report that was prepared for the World Monuments Fund is something that took a lot of painstaking effort to be able to document the building, its architecture, its interiors, uh, the materials that went into the building, the original fabrics, the furnishings, the cast iron, the stained glass, uh, and all this makes uh, for, you know, a very fun, you know, a spectacular building uh, that needs then to be very scientifically conserved. Um, and the World Monuments Fund has its own systems in place of peer review, of ensuring that at every stage, uh, the conservation, uh, you know, the authenticity of the restoration and, and uh, it is, is maintained and various stages of reviews and peer reviews have happened over the past few years to ensure the quality of this, uh, of this project. So if you see this photograph, this is an old photograph of what was the first phase of the building, which is called the old Koti, before the second phase, the second part of the building was built. And this was set in a very beautiful royal garden, which is known as the Lal Bagh, and in acres of a beautifully landscaped garden along a water body. And uh, this is the original setting of this palace. Uh, but over time, as, as the building was then moved, as, as the use and the ownership moved, it became a, a museum of the Madhya Pradesh government. And over time, we saw uh, both in terms of uh, age, as well as weathering and other issues that gradually crept up uh, on the building. And obviously, there was a need for restoration. Uh, when we began working on this, uh, on the conservation report, we were acutely aware of two things. One is that this building has a very 
strong period interior, which we wanted to be very careful about and not go into any le level of conjectural uh, reconstruction. And the second was that it has a certain layering, but also a very strong uh, layered approach towards its uh, construction as well. So what we see in the first phase of the building, the front port portico, for example, here was already changed in the second phase of construction by the Holkar family rulers themselves. And therefore, there are changes in the building that were that came about uh, during the period of the Holkar rule itself and their residence. So as a team, what we we set ourselves uh, as a period of significance was the entire period that the Holkar family was occupying this building. So even if the front porch uh, was changed to what we see today, this was considered acceptable because this was done by another ruler while he was living in this particular palace. So as far as our team and the entire conservation vision goes, the period of significance really stretches across both rulers and across the two phases of construction, both in terms of the exterior, the edifice, as well as the interior. Uh, having said that, a very catastrophic event that did play, take place in the history of this building is a fire that virtually gutted the second floor. So a lot of fire damage is all this building's, uh, you know, uh, what we inherited this building uh, with. So there was a lot of structural damage, uh, absolute, uh, you know, loss of uh, structural strength, uh, and the entire top floor of the roof uh, was entirely gutted. Uh, in addition to this, we looked at the various elements which define the building. Uh, you know, the exterior has a very strong European look. Uh, there's Italian Renaissance Revival, Baroque interiors, uh, beautiful facade elements. We have cornices, cartouches, stucco. Uh, there is a brick uh, construction, uh, lime plasters and stucco used, as well as a stone plinth. Uh, from locally locally sourced stone. Uh, so this was the set of series of drawings that were generated by the conservation team to first document every element of the building. And then this was followed up by fabric assessment drawings, which marked the condition of every element of the building, of every facade, of every interior. looking at the material assessment. And then this was followed by both material testing by a team of material uh, conservators, as well as structural endoscopic examinations and non-destructive testing that was undertaken uh, by uh, our team of structural engineers headed by Dr. Shashank Mendele. Uh, so the, this work at every point was very deep, uh, you know, scrutinized in great detail by the World Monuments Fund. And uh, at even uh, to the level of each and every drawing inventory being checked and rechecked. Uh, and this, I think, is really the backbone of any good conservation project. Because we can safely say that uh, we've been able to document uh, the building pre intervention, during intervention, and post intervention. And I hope that stays as a record of whatever was done as part of this initiative. Um, here we can see, for example, you know, a lot of damage to the exterior lime plaster, uh, to water seepage, uh, damage to the structural uh, members, which my colleague uh, Krishna Ayer, who's been uh, uh, part of our team at Abhanarayan Associates, has been working on at site, uh, and I'm sure he's going to be talking us through this in a bit. Uh, we're also uh, cognizant of all the lime plaster and stucco details uh, that are part of this building, along with the fenestration pattern uh, that is original to the building. We have uh, documented the, the damage to the original stained glass, uh, the, the lead canes. Uh, interestingly, uh, we were also faced with another issue of some of the old windows on the interior uh, using asbestos as a material that was uh, very much in vogue at that time. It was considered lightweight. It could be it could be molded into shape for the louvers in these internal shutters. And now, as a you know, asbestos abatement being an issue, uh, we that's a challenge that uh, is part of the conservation uh, team's uh, challenges. We also see a lot of additions to closed window openings or or open uh, verandas to prevent pigeons from coming in. And that is another thing that is over the over time 
him just sort of changed the way uh, the facade has been perceived. Uh, and in addition to this, even the color, because with the, the with layers of paint, uh, to be able to address the original color scheme of the building is something that has been a you know a part of the, the various concerns that the conservation team uh, has been looking at. So we first uh, created a complete conservation brief, uh, looked at the recommendations, not just for the present, uh, which become touchstones, not just for the present conservation uh, exercise, but also for the future. So that once the Madhya Pradesh government, uh, you know, takes over the project and begins to, uh, you know, put it back to uh, use, uh, this becomes embedded in the maintenance program of the Department of Archaeology, which is the custodian of this palace. Uh, so these would eventually become part of the DNA of the maintenance and upkeep of, of this beautiful palace building. Uh, and that ranges from regular maintenance guidelines to the material palette that has been worked out for this building. Uh, and this then extends to the landscape, uh, looking at the historic setting of the building, uh, looks at the interventions that are being uh, taken up in terms of a phase-wise uh, restoration. So given the, the challenges of, of conservation and funding for such projects, uh, what was worked out was a very interesting uh, model whereby the entire scope was first fleshed out by our conservation team. We created the, the master plan, so to speak, for the entire building, the outside, the inside, the structure, the interior. And then after this scoping exercise, worked out the costs involved. Uh, then there was a, 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 a sharing of roles and sharing of responsibilities, whereby the government of Madhya Pradesh, through the Department of Archaeology, is funding the structural repair and especially the, the retrofit work that is happening to address the fire damaged top floor of the building, as well as its edifice and its exterior structure. Whereas the interior restoration of some of the key period rooms on the ground floor are being funded uh, and supervised by the World Monuments Fund uh, through also corporate social responsibility from the Indigo Foundation. And by doing this, at this entire exercise is in a way uh, supervised and orchestrated by uh, my team of, of conservation architects uh, who have been working on site, uh, basically making sure that all these various projects that are happening at the same time are working in a streamlined fashion and don't in a way of uh, you know either uh, work against each other but really working in harmony it is really like a, a symphony to be able to make sure that the exterior work the interior work the contractors the conservators all work in harmony for the restoration of this building uh, this for example is the ongoing work i will ask uh, my colleague krishna to talk about this briefly, about the structural work uh, that is currently ongoing at the site. Krishna? Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Ava. Uh, so right now in these current photos, what you can see is, um, uh, uh, you can see is that we, uh, our target was to uh, start from um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, um, the top floors. So we targeted the, the second floor rooms uh, and um, uh, 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 we went about uh, the structural repairs for the second floor. So you, you can see uh, that uh, uh, some of the rooms had um, a lot of missing rafters and uh, we are uh, replacing them with like material. Uh, next. Uh, and also, we uh, um, uh, we are also doing a lot of anti-termite treatment before we uh, start with the structural repair. So you, know, you can see um, anti-termite being done to the uh, uh, um, to the rafter places where uh, the new rafters are uh, are going to be put. Uh, and also, here, here we are also uh, uh, doing a lot of testing for the new wood uh, before it comes in place for the missing. Um, uh, uh, before we uh, before it comes to the um, uh, uh, the missing rafters, thanks. Uh, we are also doing a lot of um, restoration to the existing doors and windows, and here we are doing a lot of scraping uh, to the doors and uh, also maintaining the authentic material. So um, and uh, and also um, 
uh, also adopted a traditional lime chakki at site itself. Uh, so we use authentic lime to to recreate the plaster for the exterior as, as well as for the interiors as well. Uh, here on the west side of the of the facade, we see uh, sorry the east side of the facade, we see a lot of uh, 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 a lot of deterioration in the plaster due to um, uh, due to rising damp and also due to uh, the increasing um, uh, levels of water, which uh, uh, and, and uh, you know um, which we can see the the water rising from the ground as well as. Uh, 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 as well as water uh, from the terrace, which uh, which we see, uh, while scraping out uh, the old plaster, we have come across uh, 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 a historic, um, you know, uh, uh, piece of evidence where we found that you know we could find a peach color putty behind uh, the exterior plaster. So here we are trying to get what uh, you know um, what could be the original material. Uh, 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 the material for the exterior portion. Next, uh, and also Lalbagh Palace has faced a lot of um, uh, 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 as years pass by. The historic levels have uh, uh, been hidden uh, due to a lot of development around it. So our first our first priority was to uh, to get all the historic levels back in place around around the palace so that you know uh, any uh, uh, damage to the wall. Uh, to the palace would not be uh, seen uh, in the future, uh, 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 in, 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 uh, in the future aspects as well. Okay. So here you can see the, the photograph which tell a different story of the landscape and how the landscape is a very beautifully manicured uh, neoclassical uh, landscape with a lot of symmetry and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, statuary and elements. And over time, unfortunately, it just became reduced to a kind of a municipal park. The idea is that while we are working on the, the palace itself, the entire site, which is a very extensive and expansive landscape, could be uh, restored gradually uh, back to the original design intent of this garden. Uh, by another agency, which is Smart City Indoor. And another great thing that has happened in this project is, uh, which uh, Yashwant has also been a part of a couple of meetings, is that this is really a collaborative exercise where different government departments of Madhya Pradesh government have been actively pooling in their resources, having very interesting and, and interactive discussions with the entire team, so that if we realize that there's an issue of funding, Uh, Smart City is looking at the, the larger campus and uh, the archaeology department is interacting with the World Monuments team on the building itself. And the idea is that perhaps one day the RTO building, that was the old Rampur Koti, and uh, is essentially a part of this ensemble, uh, could also be restored and adaptively reused to uh, then maybe uh, you know, create visitor facilities and, and a restaurant or a cafe, museum shop, and other exciting things that visitors and, and people of indoor or could really enjoy this entire um, ensemble in, in all its glory. So we, as part of that project, we've even looked at, look, uh, you know, relaying some of the, you know, the ubiquitous uh, red and yellow interlocking concrete pavers that have been you know brought in into this site relaying drainage to make sure that the water drains away from the building uh, perhaps uh, you know on a, a longer vision look at the nala which is really now uh, more of a you know it has been reduced to uh, uh, a kind of a waste uh, uh, nala could be revived and desilted to become the kind of a waterfront that could add value to this historic setting. Uh, then looking at uh, visitor facilities, um, amenities, and also the restoration of smaller structures within the site. This, for example, is a beautiful uh, Shiva temple, which is part of the, uh, the whole uh, legacy in the site. And that, that conservation work is also currently underway. Uh, and then looking at the larger grounds, being able to remove tons of debris that have silted the place over time. And uh, we've actually been able to uh, figure out the original levels and to be able to put back the original site levels so that water instead of 
percolating into the foundations of the building can be drained away from the building and into the into the original drainage channels. So uh, this is really conservation at many, many levels. And there's a lot of uh, different things happening uh, parallelly at the same time. And uh, now when you come into the building, we realize that there's the uh, uh, one of our biggest challenges is also how do we make sure that that these period rooms retain the the authenticity that the the interiors are known for. So when coming back to the palace, the main building, uh, it's one of the most spectacular, spectacular period interiors that we have in India. It's styled in the you know a more French Baroque uh, uh, interior, unlike most other palaces of India at the time that were very heavily influenced by British and, and Victorian and, and neo-Gothic taste. Uh, this remains very, uh, you know, French in its in its design and aesthetic sensibility, um, and uh, and very European in that sense. And Tukuji Rao II, when he extended the palace, decorated the interiors with Italian marble, furnished it in a very Western and European style. Uh, there was a lot of furniture that was brought in from Messrs. Waring and Gillows of London, Martin and Company of Cheltenham. Uh, Mr. Bernard Higgs is the architect, and there is a Baroque exuberance to the way the interiors are styled, uh, and that you can see in the quality of uh, the mirrored walls, in the quality of the uh, the electroliers, the uh, the gilding uh, on the sides, the marble floors, and truly, this is uh, one of the finest period interiors that we see in India. Uh, there's a lot of floral ornamentation, vines. Uh, acanthus leaves, tendrils, and really, a, a, especially the crown room is like almost a cornucopia of these beautiful, uh, you know, ideas of of plenty, of prosperity, of of just uh, the kind of aesthetic sensibility that uh, the Holkers uh, showered on on their building and these very elegant interiors with their obscene carpets, with their furniture intact, uh, were. In a way, were, were, though they were frayed over time, I think one amazing um, thing that did happen is that they were not displaced because over my, the last quarter of a century that I've been working in this field, it's sometimes heartbreaking to see, uh, you know, old cast iron bathtubs in the Viceregal Lodge in Shimla, for example, that were just pulled out and used as planters in the gardens or old maple furniture was broken and just filled up a, a swimming pool. Here, fortunately, uh, the Madhya Pradesh government uh, did not move out the furniture, let, let the furniture be, let the portraits and all be there. So other than time and water and, and age that has, has damaged um, a lot of the interiors, they are fortunately not overpainted in ridiculous oil paints or you know, painted pink and blue. Uh, so in a way, it is, it's almost fortunate that there was not too much change uh, and therefore it is not undoing a lot of bad repair, but just restoration that we are able to focus on. Uh, so when we are dealing with such a beautiful building and such a precious interior, uh, again, our first challenge as, an, uh, as a conservation team was to try and understand and document what we found uh, try and do research on where these influences came in from, where the materials came in from, and then make sure that each and every element, be it an, a, you know, a, a mural or a stretched canvas or a, you know, a, a molding, was respectfully restored. And at that point, uh, we look at all the various elements that build up this fabulous interior, be it the plaster work, the, the stone work, the furniture, the fittings, uh, each one plays an equally important role. And uh, the restoration of each element, be it the sprung loaded wooden floors of the, the, uh, you know, the central dance floor or the chandeliers. And, and another thing which is very, very unique and very amazing about this building is the level of finesse that the, the services had. For example, because you had such a high ceiling of a stretched fabric ceiling uh, covering the main, uh, you know, this double height central atrium, 
there was actually a mechanical lift that was meant for you know uh, that was meant for cleaning the chandeliers and for maintenance or a building of this vintage that had dumb waiters and lifts for for service or had uh, you know a, a, a tunnel at, in a basement linking the kitchens across the the waterfront and going under that to bring it to the main palace and the electrical toggles and each and every element of the services of this building is absolutely fantastic and therefore for us as a team as a conservation team we're also very acutely aware of just the significance of of this in terms of the period that this building represents so uh, we've also been looking at visitor movement once the the uh, restoration work is completed so if you see the plan here what we are working on currently is on the ground level to take up this entire work of all the period rooms that happen uh, that are seen on on this new wing of the building which includes the the crown hall which is obviously the most significant interior the sitting room which is linked to the crown hall across a beautiful stairwell the western style dining room the council room uh, the indian style dining room and the office so these are the the period interiors that are where work of conservation is now nearly complete. And um, as and as we complete every bit of the work, uh, we then move on from there to uh, create a kind of a, a, a circulation so that visitors who would come to the museum would be able to see it and to be able to appreciate it. And at the same time, to take up another space in the museum that could then be taken up for restoration. Uh, so this is uh, this is the condition we found many of the rooms in, uh, and therefore this is the condition we found a lot of the carpets in, just rolled up. So the work of restoration is not only just involved the civil work or the the finishes, but also a lot of very fragile, very fragile and very precious uh, furnishings in the building. Uh, so our conservation approach has been directed by a few. touchstones of respect for the original design, the site significance, respect for the historic fabric, the period of significance, and, and to be able to keep the integrity of the building, the design aesthetic, uh, you know, unbroken. And uh, that includes, uh, you know, concerns of inclusivity, of accessibility, and especially of authenticity, because, uh, you know, at the end of this conservation project, we want to be able to, uh, you know, be very proud of the fact that we have kept authenticity of design, of material, of workmanship uh, paramount in all our concerns to the best uh, that we could. Uh, so various uh, systems uh, you know, have already been built into the conservation plan for this, uh, which also include just very carefully sequencing the works that are happening uh, at present, and uh, then interpreting each and every period room as it were. Uh, looking at archival research and for this I, uh, I'm very keen to, as we are restoring the furniture, to have uh, more interactions with the royal family, with the Sri Vajendra Gargye, with the, uh, uh, Yashwant and uh, obviously uh, Richard Holkar, in terms of how best to place the right elements in the right places uh, as the family remembered them in use. Uh, this, for example, is the beautiful salon, and this is an old photograph of of the the space before uh, this was handed over to the to the government of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, but here we see no furniture for now. Uh, this is a photograph of of present day where it is, and we do see furniture. Fortunately, I mean this is one of some of the finest specimens of period furniture that we do have in India. Uh, but yet again, both the restoration and the placement of the furniture, the design of the bollards, the the placement of the carpets is what is uh, going to be you know key right uh, you know as we near the completion of the project. This is a photograph of the upper floor, which shows the original placement of furniture when the uh, the old koti was in use. And again, what is interesting is uh, the photograph of the old koti has a very strong English period uh, influence. So here you can pretty much 
identify maple furniture and, and an English Victorian style of furniture, which obviously went for a makeover even during the, the period of the Holker residence, when the second phase of the building came, uh, came up and the entire interior changed to a very strong French furniture aesthetic. So what we see here is not, we don't have any of these pieces in the palace right now, because what we have in the palace is uh, the more French style furniture. This is the same space today uh, where there was a lot of leakage, there was a lot of fire damage, and that is what is, uh, you know, something that is being taken up for conservation today. Uh, this another is another space on the upper floor uh, where we see the furniture and in its period setting, the carpets, the chairs, the, the chandeliers. And uh, this is how we found this space. Uh, fortunately, most of the, the plaster work and uh, you know, the, the, the finishes intact, though overpainted in some areas, but a lot of different chairs that have been piled up. And this area too suffered a lot of damage from both uh, water ingress as well as structural damage above the, pla uh, the last plaster ceilings to the wooden rafters that were supporting this ceiling. Uh, and now coming to you know the banquet hall for example spectacular furniture and uh, uh, and all the chandeliers and this is the Indian dining room where uh, with a with almost a Moorish sort of a uh, you know you can almost see a a Moorish influence on the ceiling on the plaster work uh, where the uh, the Indian style dining uh, happened and this then is uh, the Western. Uh, the council room with a very strong uh, European aesthetic with uh, uh, Victorian paints and, and silk damask chairs, uh, the upper bedrooms with four, four poster silver beds, uh, almost left as if, uh, you know, they were just as if frozen in time. And uh, this is a charming uh, Wedgwood style freeze room with Grecian motifs and the plaster work is exceptional in this particular room. This is a crown room before we start the restoration and I'm going to pull in uh, Anupam Shah, a very famous art conservator who uh, we approached while we were working on this project because again we divided this entire work being the co complex uh, conservation project that it is. Uh, in terms of execution, it is also has different Uh, people working on the execution of it. So the, the structural conservation work is being undertaken by uh, a contracting firm uh, that has been appointed through government tender for the roof and the structural repair. Uh, the World Monuments Fund contracted another team of uh, contractors who worked on historic palaces such as the Chomahala Palace and Jebelas Palace before to work on many of the rooms and the plasters and the the uh, the uh, flooring restoration, uh, but in, in some of the rooms which required a lot more painting and art conservation, uh, Anupam Shah's team at the Heritage Lab have been working on these uh, rooms. And uh, this is some of, you know, these are the details of some of these for which we couldn't just deal with any kind of contracting or lab labor agency. We had to deal with trained art conservators we working on every inch of this room because we have the most exceptional lime plasters, stucco work, stencils, uh, uh, lacquer, wood carving, uh, fluted plasters, and just amazing paintings that we see as part of this interior. Uh, this is uh, a photograph of, uh, you know, a side photograph that I've taken of work in progress. And uh, I will request Anupam to talk about uh, some of the work that uh, has been uh, going on uh, with his team uh, on restoring these buildings room by room, inch by inch, Anupam. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abha, for this. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for inviting us to be part of this presentation and also for, uh, for participating in it uh, as an informed audience. Um, um, First of all, um, I would begin, uh, I would pick up the thread uh, uh, by putting us all on the same platform as far as uh, the uh, conservation of the um, 
uh, the small tangible pretty elements of this uh, magnificent edifices. When we talk about conservation for the purposes of my talk for the next five, six minutes, uh, conservation would be any action aimed at increasing the life of the object, or enhancing the longevity of the object, period. And I would say conservation, it pertains to those interventions. And when we talk about restoration, I would particularly mean any action which is aimed at enhancing the message of the element, that would be restoration. It would have no bearing on the longevity of the object, but on the, uh, the message that the object wants to convey, even if it's the brilliance of the gold. If that has to be intervened on, we must remember it is not increasing the life of this beautiful um, uh, the, the element, but it would just increase the message, right? Enhance the message. So we were invited to be part of this team. And I must say, even from this presentation, something which we might be taking for granted is the fact it's the meticulousness and the rigor with which uh, the Abhanarayan Lamba Associates team has documented everything and put it down, indicted it correctly in terms of terminologies from the identification of every piece of furniture to of course all the other elements that are there in architecture. Uh, but that itself is an effort and Abha, you all of you probably take it for granted, but believe me, uh, you don't get this everywhere. And thank you very much for it. Because when you bring us into it in a project like this with all this database already there, it allows us to take very, very informed decisions to make correct interventions. Because eventually at the end of the day, it's neither yours nor ours, Abha. It is about, it is about this, uh, this thing that was created in the past because of the efforts of uh, various ladies and gentlemen who were the patrons of it and uh, who took it upon themselves to create something beautiful, isn't it? So I think all our efforts have been aimed at ensuring, as you mentioned earlier, the authenticity of uh, this place and the historicity. And in some cases, even the sublimity of it, I think. Well, when I see some of these images here, we must remember that when we were asked to do the conservation and restoration of these historic interiors, the first thing that we did was you establish a team. Now, this was extremely uh, multidisciplinary. In fact, it was transdisciplinary. You had um, uh, paintings in oils on canvases. There were canvases on frames which were hung on walls, but there were also canvases like this tondo that you see here, canvases which were part of the architecture by now. They were fitted in as part of the architecture. They were there on the walls, and as you saw a little bit earlier, they were there on the ceilings also. Could I go ahead to the next slide, please, if you have? Yeah, so these are, these are various elements that the team has put together that talk about the various elements that were looked at. So there was conservation of the stucco, there was conservation of the paintings, there was conservation of the gilded frames. And there was all these stucco elements, which were polychrome. Uh, there were furnitures. Can we go ahead, please? So there were various types of furniture. There were the moldings. There were the moldings that were forming the frame for all these um, uh, of these elements. Next. So here again, uh, you know, we've very uh, documented the doors, the windows, the hardware, because there's just this is almost like a textbook of you know every doorknob, all drop fastener, stay, hinge, espionole, uh, we've, there's such a, a beautiful range of hardware. This, this is something that an architecture and interior student can virtually learn from in terms of what we have uh, in this building. And uh, that is, uh, so ba over back, back to you, uh, Anupam. Yeah. So when we were asked to do the conservation of these things, the first thing that we did was the World Monument Fund graciously said, okay, let's ship in a bit of resources also for the understanding of the material and technology of these objects. 
So that meant uh, doing X-ray fluorescence tests on the various types of paint layers. Uh, it meant uh, FTIR uh, analysis of some of the products that we used here. It meant uh, um, analyzing all the various types of materials that we used for creation of uh, these various surfaces. So, and next please. So as we went on with this, uh, if you can make me the host then I could move the um, so slide I'll, I'll just, myself. It doesn't matter. I'll Thank just... you. So one of the one of the dramatic things you see what happens is when you do conservation sometimes and if you, you know, sometimes conservation is much under the earth so to speak it is not evident and it takes extremely concerted efforts over you know over a long period of time to get the results but it is not visible there are some conservation results like the ones that I'm showing to you which are very visible and they look quite dramatic and this is also to express the fact that while I may be showing you things which are really dramatic. We must remember that there were n number of young men and women and teams who have done work for the conservation of this historic structure, whose work is not visible out there on the surface. But that is extremely, extremely um, noteworthy and it needs to be acknowledged also. In this case, these are the moldings that were treated. So here, the fact was that because the moldings were all now falling apart and loosened, they were all put back in place. Only those which are completely lost were then recreated using silicone molds. You know, it's a normal process. Uh, it's, it's a well-documented and recorded process now. So the various, so what we did was we also took references of the earlier recordings that were there and created the molds uh, from extant uh, elements that were available. Next, please. So this is just showing how a mold has been recreated again on the wooden uh, uh, doors and places. And everything is recorded, so you know exact. Because now, after the restoration, um, it all looks the same. Uh, in fact, uh, we've been helped a lot by uh, some paint agencies uh, like Surfer Coats from Bangalore, um, who we could, uh, you know, we use the spectrophotometers to get the exact tones from the liquid uh, paints that we could create for this. And so, what we got were absolute matches of the paint material. Next, please. Yes, and then when it came to the cleaning of the artworks, it is just like uh, an, um, a painting conservation process uh, with due diligence and uh, uh, understanding all the various types of layers that were there. There were darkened varnishes, there were deposits of soot and grime, which were then sandwiched in other varnishes, and all those extraneous uh, layers were removed, and uh, the paintings were brought forth uh, back unto light again. And there were really impressive paintings on the ceilings. Yes, please, really beautiful. And the mirrors too, there was lovely glass. Fortunately, the glass is of extremely, extremely good quality. There was no glass that was weeping. Uh, there was no frizzling on the glass. Uh, it needed surface treatments and they were done uh, appropriately. And um, these beautiful um, ceiling paintings uh, are now reflecting, not only when you look up at the ceiling, but even if you look at yourself in the mirror and you have the ceiling reflecting. It's you who's almost there in the ceiling through the, through the glasses. So these are some of the elements. Uh, this is the way the conservation work was going on. Uh, in these, in these um, presentations, I don't see so much of my teams, but that will be for another story some other time. Next week. Yeah, we got some of them. Thank you. Um, so you just, just a little image that they very um, consciously put there and aptly is you see that swab on the bottom left corner, you see the amount of grime that's coming out from these surfaces, right? So slow process, but the results are so well worth it. Next, please. Next. Yeah, so these are the stucco figures which were covered with layers and layers of grime and surface uh, particulate matter deposits over time. And they were brought forth in beautiful brilliance once again. Next, please. Yes, we'll go ahead. We'll go ahead a bit. Yeah. I think we'll go to where the furniture is. This is for you to take in the places. Next, please. Yeah. The purpurina, which was used. Um, so this the is, uh, the these are some of the paint shades and, and the whole process of laying out paints, checking them samples and mock-ups and on site. And while we're talking about the team, uh, I would like to also acknowledge the fact that this, uh, even from 
both Anupam's team and my studio. We've had some amazing uh, ladies who were not able to join, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we, uh, some of them are here on this. So Priti Garg, who is uh, another director with, uh, with my firm, uh, has been part of the restoration of the interior. Krishna has already spoken about the the restoration of the building uh, edifice. And we've had a very brave, uh, two very brave young architects from Madhya Pradesh, uh, Sakshi Dube, who was our on-site architect for uh, through the lockdown period, uh, braving, braving uh, the lockdown and uh, supervising work at site. And uh, Ananya Mishra, who I think is part of this uh, uh, the uh, seminar today, who's also been at site working on ensuring that the quality of, of supervision and conservation work is uh, uh, it's not compromised. So, uh, yeah, uh, Anupam, over to you. Anupam, you're on mute again. Right, let's go ahead with some of these images. Let's get to the furniture. Yes, thank you. So the furniture right. here, we have a whole, uh, you know, range of rich mahogany, oak, walnut, rosewood, uh, beautiful uh, furniture with brocade, with jacquards, silks, and, uh, you know, a whole range of chairs uh, that uh, are part of different, different spaces within the palace. And we did a very extensive uh, documentation and inventory of each and every piece of furniture. Uh, that we found at the site, uh, and then also documented the condition that it was found in. Uh, with this, Anupam's team took over the restoration, and uh, Anupam, over. over. Yeah. So these were, um, so the, the guiding um, principle that we followed in treating the furniture was that um, while um, things seem to be in tatters, the fact is that uh, uh, they have either come loose or they need a little support. So what we did was while we brought in uh, fresh uh, elements uh, into the conservation of uh, the furniture, we used the existing materials in their positions and did everything over them. So tomorrow, tomorrow if there's a researcher who wants to see exactly how this was made earlier on, right? Uh, they all they have to do is remove the work that we have done from the top and inside, and the work we've done on the top will hold everything together for the next, you know, so many years. But the fact is, in terms of the originality of the materials, you will find them all there, disinfected, treated, but placed back again in the same stratigraphy, in the same positions with the same materials. So I think that's been a good learning. Uh, from this uh, project. And again, I'd like to just pipe in, yeah. in terms of uh, 20 years ago, when I was working on the Chomahala Palace project, uh, a similar exercise was done for the period furniture. And a team under Alana Dowling, who's uh, no longer with us, she's brought in a team of English furniture restorers. And we found that that furniture had, as part of the stuffing, was horsehair. And for us, 20 years ago, we had to actually bring in horsehair Or the stuffing. So I remember when we were having this conversation with World Monuments Fund and with Yashwant at site before we started uh, uh, the furniture restoration work, my one concern was what is going to happen when we remove the, the layers of, of upholstery and fabric to see what's inside and what if there's horse hair and where on earth are we going to find such quantities. Fortunately, in the Holkar Palace, we found, uh, we found uh, vegetable, I mean, we, we found uh, uh, coconut and we found hessian and, and jute and not not uh, animal hair uh, as a filling. So uh, this is these are you know some images of the work uh, that's gone into the furniture restoration, and uh, a before and after. And again, what we have been uh, very respectful of is every little square inch of historic fabric that we have found on site. So each of the the jacquards and the the motifs and the fabrics of curtains, of drapes, of valances, of, of uh, different chairs have been documented, categorized, 
uh, and then research to be able to now, which is this, the phase we are in, to be able to replicate and recreate exactly the same patterns in weaves, to be able to now go into the restoration and recreation of the soft furnishings and the fabrics. And this is a conversation that we've been having with, uh, you know, a Bangalore uh, uh, firm that have, they are helping us recreate this. And Anupam has done a lot of work with researching these fabrics as well. So there's a lot of R&D that has gone into trying to replicate these weaves in just the right material and the right fabric. Doing the same with the windows, the doors, the hardware, fixing the toggles, uh, and each and every element. Uh, now we're currently working on trying to, to match the old fringes and the tassels on each and every element on a lampshade, on, on a, uh, a curtain balance, and also the carpets, which are another story in, in this whole restoration exercise. Anupam, you, you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't realize. Yes, of course, we did the carpets also. There were these huge <laughs> carpets which we brought out here. You get a scale of this when you see this photograph taken from an upper um, platform, so to speak. Um, and the, 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 the carpets were um, uh, documented. Uh, they were extremely damaged in the sense their supports at the base were completely, um, um, they, they had fallen apart, so to speak. And also there was a phenomenal amount of insect infestation, which happens sometimes in the monsoons. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so the carpets were cleaned and they were treated. Next, please. And we must remember that the carpets always have, um, you know, different types of elements when it comes to um, uh, their wool. So there were two, three types of wool that was used for the pipings and for the main, um, uh, the body of the work, and then um, and even dyes. Uh, the dye. Next, please. Yeah, the different dyes that was so everything was dyed so in situ. On everything site was to be able to recreate there. the the yes. Done on site. Yes. And then uh, the restoration of, of the electroliers, rewiring some of these old pieces to be able to bring back, uh, bring them back to life, uh, looking at the toggles, the electrical fittings, the hardware. Uh, and now we would be eventually moving on to uh, the restoration of these fantastic bathrooms uh, and along with all the sanitary fittings, but that is yet to come. And uh, finally, I would, what I would like to end at is to say that this is a work in progress. Something, you know, a, the kind of complexity and the kind of funding required for a project of this complexity is a huge challenge. And I, I salute the World Monuments Fund and, and the Madhya Pradesh government in their, in their effort to initiate and keep the, the levels of conservation so high in this project. But at this same time, we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of funds that are required to put back these sort of later additions of, of uh, art galleries to bring back the light fittings, to look at all the other floors and you know the areas on the upper floor which were gutted. Uh, uh, and in, in this sort of condition with the kind of severe damage, uh, when the structural work is ready and done, uh, for example, this entire roof was completely burnt down. So it's a completely new structural system that is being put back now. Uh, and the hope is that this should become an opportunity for a cultural revival in Indore. And, and uh, what, uh, you know, a few years ago, what my team had done for Bikaner House, uh, for Rajasthan government, Bikaner House, uh, Delhi, we used the conservation of Bikaner House as an opportunity to create a cultural hub in the city of Delhi. I hope that with the restoration of the Holkar uh, Lalba Palace in, the, in Indore, we can use this opportunity of restoring the upper floors. So while the ground floor and the first floor remain the museum with the Madhya Pradesh government, perhaps the top floor could be, uh, you know, uh, once it's restored, it could be adaptively reused to create a space for citizens of Indore as a cultural space where they could come for book reviews, for readings, for exhibitions, for art galleries. Uh, and that would take, I think, as much help from the local population of Indore and the stakeholders and the Holkars. And I hope that we are able to create uh, what the, this is something of what we've done in Bikaner House, where it's, we have uh, 
we would, I hope, be able to take this to that level at, in, at Lal Bagh, where we can then use, bring in spaces, bring in, uh, you know, art exhibitions, uh, be able to create a Holkar gallery to even talk about the, the historic history of the royal family and how they used these spaces. Uh, bring in uh, interpretation tools such as brochures, art, uh, you know, information uh, uh, installations, museum installations, costumes, uh, historic fabrics, and be able to revive this as a complete project and be able to give back to the city of Indore uh, something that they're very, very proud of. And I think I will end at that note and uh, hope that, uh, you know, that This project will not just end at just the restoration of the, you know, the two, the, the ground floor. And I hope that uh, people will continue to support uh, the uh, World Monument Fund and the Madhya Pradesh Government Initiative uh, to be able to give back, uh, you know, the Holka legacy, uh, its, its, its um, revival of its most beautiful palace. Thank you so much, Abha. That's a fascinating presentation and uh, to all of your colleagues Krishna Anupam very very much uh, I think I can speak for everybody that we enjoyed uh, learning about the journey that you've been on so far in this restoration and looking forward to achieving um, the full potential as you said of, of this wonderful palace as a space for uh, culture and uh, congregation in Indoor that's wonderful um uh, supriya maybe we can start taking some questions yes we'll, we'll from the audience forward. yes yes so uh, first question is from uh, richard holker any knowledge of early architects do we have any knowledge of early architects uh well apart from what the madhya pradesh government had given us as a brochure uh but again that was not uh the, uh, the name of the architect is something that has, has escaped uh, uh, record in this project because while most, you know, palaces of this scale have, you know, very well documented uh, architects of the period, uh, there, apart from one name that already appeared in earlier in my slide presentation, we haven't been able to, uh, you know, to get too much information on either old drawings or the architects on both phases of, uh, of construction. I'd be very happy to, you know, receive any information uh, if if there's anyone who can give us some leads on this. Uh, we are moving to the second question. Uh, this is from Rishi pa uh, Rishi Pagnis. Considering that the palace was built in three phases and Dalbagh Palace first got got power in 1906, what kind of challenges did you face with electrical fixtures and wiring? So the, the challenges are that we don't want to chase the walls. We don't want to put in PVC conduits and we want to continue with, with the original uh, wiring and the original uh, you know, uh, routings. So given that, what we are trying best to do is just at the most, uh, you know, uh, do, I mean, do as little change as possible and uh, not not, not bring in any intervention unless it's absolutely required. So exactly what Anupam said. Uh, so as of today, other than maybe a few chandeliers which needed to be rewired because uh, you know that that had completely uh, miss, uh, gone missing, uh, we are trying not even to remove a toggle or to displace it from the site. So another question from Richard Holker: Shall we contact the French ambassador, reference interest, and funding? Mr. So Holker, I think any fund that we are able to get, uh, we would be very grateful for because I think uh, uh, every penny counts in a project that is this ambitious. Uh, we would we would be happy to get, uh, and I'm sure the World Monuments Fund would be more than happy to uh, to you know with along with you reach out to any uh, for any source of funding. Uh, next question is from Space One One Eight. What about Manikbagh Palace? Has that also been restored? Uh, 
Well, I think I can't answer that. Uh, yes, that's something that the government of Madhya Pradesh would be better uh, suited to answer. My okay. mandate is is limited to Lal Bagh, and I think that too is it's a huge challenge. And we're we're very grateful for the opportunity, but uh, Manik Bagh is not currently part of our mandate. Then uh, the next question from Richard Holker is: uh, What was the furniture made? Where was the furniture made? So the furniture is part French and part in the French style, but made by uh, English firms such as Gillows, for example. Uh, so it's because we've actually found uh, you know some markings on some of those, uh, but definitely the style is is more uh, is European and not not an English style, so to speak. And where were the uh, original artisans came from? This was all imported straight, shipped out of Europe and into uh, into uh, Indore. In fact, when you, if you, if I was looking at you know some of the finest uh, palaces of the period, uh, Maple and Company virtually furnished all of the Viceroy's Lodge in Shimla. And they used to put it out even in their ad advertisement. They used to advertise that we have shipped grand pianos and taken that, them across the Khyber Pass. Uh, the entire lot, a shipload of maple furniture that was meant for Umed Bhavan in Jodhpur sank in a ship. And therefore, in Jodhpur, uh, Lanchester actually commissioned local Rajasthani craftsmen to create furniture, which we currently see. In indoor Lal Bagh Palace, all the furniture was shipped in straight from Europe and not built or not crafted in India, because this was meant to be a European interior. Next question is, what about fading of colors over the years in restoration? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. What about fading of colors over the years in restoration? Uh, well, there are fugitive colors. I think uh, Anupam can talk more about that. Anupam, I'll give you. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good uh, that's a good remark. Um, yes, uh, with light, pigments tend to fade. Uh, when the restoration is being done, uh, they're being done with uh, very, very high quality pigments. And the binding need is such that it will not discolor or alter or become yellow and brown because that will also take, change the tonality of the colors. So that uh, thing has been taken uh, to attention and uh, that's a very pertinent point, thank you. And this is how we addressed it. Uh, next question is from Vijay Rajopadhyay. Who designed the carpets of Lal Bagh Palace? Uh, if I... Anupam, over to you. Well, uh, some carpets, uh, again, if I, if I were to reference and cross-reference other palaces in India, uh, for example, uh, Jevalas Palace, they, these were jail carpets actually woven on site in the Darbar Hall of Jevalas Palace and made to fit uh, the Darbar Hall. In the case of, again, uh, Lal Bagh, again, I'll, I'll repeat, I'd be repeating myself because it was meant to be such a European interior. The carpets are all carpets uh, which were shipped in into India. The, none of none of the carpets that we see in Lal Bagh, Indore are sort of Indian jail carpets or or carpets manufactured in India. They were really uh, European carpets that were shipped into India. Is this the only structure of its aesthetics in India? This is from Richard Volker. Well, I mean, at least I can say that I've been working as an architect in this field for the last 27 years. And this interior just blew me away because the quality of every element in this interior is truly spectacular. Uh, next question from Samartha Guha. Uh, hello, Abba ma'am. While you are for 25 years, do you find any possibility to create something new or uh, you have to go through uh, while uh, you have to go through the protocols while restoration? See, if I'm adding a new building, which we are, we are doing a lot of new buildings across 
uh, Mumbai and other places. We have, you know, we, we create new buildings and new things. But I will not take the liberty in a historic palace such as Lal Bagh when I'm given the charge of restoring it to do something that is conjectural and a kind of a fake uh, addition. I would rather be true to the, you know, to the ethics of conservation and international charters and try and be, uh, you know, uphold uh, as we, that's why we, we put out there what our intent uh, and what the vision of this project is. And certainly uh, the idea is to stay clearly on the path of conservation to extend the life of of an object or the building and rest, re restore wherever we have restored it's not conjectural because it's entirely documented and based on the original uh, detail and the original design uh, next question is what school of thought represent murals of lalbagh palace anupam would you like to answer that yeah um well uh, as has been expressed earlier um uh, that this is you know the italian renaissance then went on to baroque and all these elements there are no particular murals as such maybe what they're referring to are the ceiling paintings they're all oil paintings on canvas by the way the canvas is interesting because there are no stitches in between they are huge canvas they're very very huge and um and they are fixed as architect as elements uh, on the ceiling. So there are no true murals as such. We do uh, see a bit of stenciling, uh, you know, in that little corridor that leads from the, the grand salon into the, uh, the yeah. dining hall. Uh, those are, I mean, some of them are even Egyptian sort of, they evoked more Egyptian uh, motifs, but they, these are stenciled. Uh, Yes, those were common, uh, they were common motifs that were used at these certain periods of time. I mean, if you see a book on style uh, over the, you know, over, over, over periods, you will find these elements there. Yes, our very true, especially on that, you know, the oh, absolute sort of, well, yes, yes, there are. And the carpets, uh, Abha, interestingly, the carpets have Indian workmanship, the hands are Indian. So that's so, that's an element we need to talk about it. The designs are all Persian. So but again, I think I would uh, once once more like yeah, once more I would like to you know just say how amazing uh, you know how um, amazingly fortunate we are uh, in the case of the Lalbagh Palace that a the Madhya Pradesh government had the foresight to see that they didn't do any major changes to the palace yeah. in all these years that were detrimental because one's also seen that happen. Uh, you know where where build parts of the building were gutted or, or major changes and secondly to have the foresight to bring in a world monuments fund into this project and work collaboratively so that the scales and the the quality of conservation uh, dialogue really is has been tremendous in this project so each element and every every suggestion of conservation goes through a process of vetting through a peer review and internal fra review framework by world monument fund amita beg uh, you know has been a, a great uh, a resource in this as well as world monuments fund flying in experts all the way from america and new york to review our work uh, the government of madhya pradesh the department of archaeology the secretary culture the chief secretary each one sort of so positively engaging in this project that it's it's a great uh, you know it's very admirable for any uh, you know any government supported project to go through this level of of uh, dialogue the last question we have uh, from smita uh, was the name lalba given because red sandstone was used extensively that i would ask Richard Holker to answer so that question. Uh, Mr. Ho uh, I think I think that from the Holker family would be a better answer. I'm sorry, I, I, Abba, but I'm the wrong person. Maybe uh -huh. Yashwant has a better knowledge. So Yashwant, over to you. <laughs> well, I uh, actually uh, Rishi Pagnisji has just uh, uh, added a comment of it was named after a rose garden. So that might be interesting, um, which actually segues, uh, Abba, I'd like to ask a question on uh, the gardens, which were actually such uh, an interesting feature of the palace. And 
if you have, if you're able to just show um, the uh, plan view at the top, I noticed that there is a feature on the left side. I don't know if that's west or, or which looked like a, a fountain um, or it looked like some feature. And yeah, which, yeah, here, uh, over there on the, on the left. Uh, we lost that just for a second. So I wanted to know what that that was. Were there was there a fountain there, and what one could be? What you know, um, the gardens and the exterior spaces are to have this uh, amount of space in the heart of Indore is really quite unique. So um, it would be wonderful to to see how the gardens could be. Um, uh, restored to what the original design was. I think that was something you talked on. Um, but then what the other uses of that space, because these spaces need to be kept alive and, um, and vibrant, and in a way that could also perhaps sustain um, the restoration. So, so my two questions are one, what is this interesting structure on the left of the palace here? Uh, and number two, what would your uh, thoughts for the gardens be? Well, uh, the garden is laid out. It, firstly, I think for any city to have such a large open space uh, is something that, you know, is, is a green lung for the city. And therefore, it's not just a cultural site, but it's also a wonderful green space within the city that Indore should be very uh, zealously uh, proud of. Uh, this, what you see as some features which have a very strong symmetry uh, uh, in terms of planning as garden features, there were uh, pathways laid out. There were uh, there were water cisterns as well as statuary. There's cast iron statuary. There's uh, uh, you know and fountains in this garden. Uh, there was also a rose garden, as was rightly said. Uh, the thing, therefore, is that every time uh, you know there is a discussion on. Uh, landscaping this area, uh, whether it happens under smart city or it happens under the municipal corporation or under any other agency. Uh, what is critical is that the fact that this is not just an, a garden, it is a garden, it's a public open space, but it's also a historic landscape. So that needs to be sort of front and center in any work of, uh, you know, where, where that involves public funds to be put into this space is that whatever is the material or the design should not be in conflict with the fact that this is a, a historic landscape. Um, can I just interject uh, for a moment? I just got a flag uh, from uh, somebody who's been very closely connected with the Hokers and whose father had mentioned something to me about somebody who was still existing in Indore and it was some years ago, um, who uh, was one of the gardeners uh, of uh, the Lalbagh uh, garden. I don't know if uh, Ashish and Anu Dube are part of this conversation, uh, but if they are, they might be able to interject. If not, uh, I think we can contact them. I would be pretty surprised if this uh, person was still alive because I'm talking about somebody who was involved in the gardens which existed at the time of my grandfather, let's say in 1960. Um, but uh, today, uh, I'd be surprised if he were still around. Uh, you know, what's also interesting is while we were researching this, uh, the very famous planner, Patrick Geddes, uh, was invited to visit Indore. And in one of Patrick Geddes' uh, books, he actually has a sketch of the Lalba garden. And he had suggested some design interventions for it as well. So uh, yes, this is a, an extremely important and very significant green space. And uh, I just hope that uh, you know uh, the various agencies that will undertake the works here would be would be truly cognizant of this, uh, of this historic landscape. Yeah, you know, Abha, um, when it comes, one thing that comes to mind is at this period, the period that we're talking about of the evolution of this, the setting of this with the water element there and the building and the garden, we must also remember this was the period when the pittoresco or the picturesque <laughs> was very much in not just in vogue, but it was very much a part of uh, the conscious um, 
um, uh, driving factors for people who created these spaces. So I think it's the picturesque that we must also invoke when we're talking about this, not just as a garden, but as you said, it's like a setting for this, for the viewer also from various angles. So, and if we research the trees a little bit, you might actually see which were the major trees and the elements which formed the framing of this from points of view. And I think that these are things that we've got to look at. It's not just the garden or the layout of plants in this space, but the visual, the almost like a picture that you will be able to see from various angles of this structure, I suppose. Absolutely. Ms. Rajay wants to say something, I think. Hello, hello, Abba, how are you? Hello, thank you. Actually, I wanted to know because uh, in the gardens, there is a very well worked out system of, of surface water drainage and um, uh, it's the, the surface water management. It is very well worked out over there. Could you find remnants of that? Because there are, it is now broken into bits and pieces, but there is a lot of uh, remnants of uh, surface water management. You're absolutely right. And uh, Krishna has been working on trying to uh, restore the original site levels. So what happened over the last few decades is that uh, you know, over time, over the original uh, pathways, there was concrete, uh, you know, uh, uh, that was laid on, which changed the levels of the water. Hmm. Yeah. And again, because of just the accumulation of debris over the years and the silting up, not just uh, the, uh, you know, the rest of the garden, but especially the area around adjoining the main building, water instead of draining away from the building because the levels of the, the ground were increased, water was actually draining into the building. And that was yeah. the cause of a lot of rising damp and a lot of water ingress that was damaging the building. So yeah. what um, my colleague Krishna has been working with the Madhya Pradesh government is to remove these layers and to, and to correct the levels of the original landscape so that water drains into that into the waterway and actually drains away from the building and we yes. found we poles we've now been able to uh, find the original you know the embankment levels and the and the yeah. uh, the, uh, the the walls that were supporting yeah us. it was all connected with the river level so maybe you will be able to regenerate or rejuvenate the system well we also hope that we also hope that as a larger part of uh, you know the municipal corporation and the smart city works that the entire nala would be desilted and it would go back to being a river rather than you know just stagnant water yeah. so that too is a larger city vision that is uh, that is underway uh, another question is like it is um, said that the entrance gate is a replica of the gate of buckingham palace did you find it is true it is true. That is true. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's very true. <laughs> okay. That's it. Bye bye. Uh, Abha, sorry, uh, Yashwant again. Just wanted to confirm. I've made what? What is this structure over there? The circular structure on the left. Oh, that's this, uh, Krishna. Do you want to talk about it? Krishna, you're on mute. Huh? Yeah, so uh, it's actually, uh, it's not a structure. Uh, we found uh, a fountain there and the, um, it, uh, and there's a circular design uh, which was made around the fountain. So there's no structure there actually, but um, it's actually a landscape uh, designed element there right now. Ah, it is a fountain. Yeah. Okay. It's a fountain, Thank yes, you. it is. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Supriya, so I think uh, we've gone through our questions um, and we've uh, we've probably taken up uh, all of our time. So shall we move to closing remarks? Abba, can I ask a question? Feroza here. Hi, Feroza. Uh, yeah, of course. Hello. What was Patrick Geddes doing in Indore? <laughs> you know, Patrick Geddes is quite a soul. He landed yes. up, uh, in Patiala uh, at the invitation of the Maharaja Patiala. 
and in indor and for both cities he wrote out plans and made very strong recommendations which were never implemented because i've seen his his uh, his recommendations for patiala as well as for indor but no I, he's written extensively on indor i wasn't looking at patiala because of this lecture this event but uh, he was here in the early 20th century in the 1918 1920 period and it was just a, a plan no implementation uh not that i know of maybe someone from indore would be able to tell us a little more but the plan was certainly what i've seen i'm not very sure of whether any part of it was implemented or not abba uh, if i can interject here uh, richard holker yeah. um my understanding is that the grid of indore was laid out by um uh, patrick gettys uh, of the main avenues and the main avenues uh and the traffic patterns which he uh, provided for uh were uh sufficient for the growth of indoor until uh the middle of the 20th century oh wonderful there you go so i didn't know about it thank you because he's very critical to town planning everywhere and quite relevant even today thank you thank you for us aunty lovely to see you today uh so priya if there is and if there isn't anybody uh further let's uh yeah one question oh. from sandeep dai sir kar uh can you give some information on the temple 1 and 2 uh, near the palace uh this is a shiva temple it's almost sunken in it's like you go down into a kind of a a kund and then approach this temple and there are two beautiful temples in the local stone uh krishna would you like to add something uh, uh yeah actually uh, uh, even the temple uh, uh, has a step well associated with it so it uh, the step well actually goes down to the river uh, both the uh, the step wells and uh, 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 and actually one of the step wells is close to the rto building also as well um so yeah Uh, so on behalf of the holkar cultural uh, center team first of all i would like to thank our guest lecturer uh, abha narayan lamba uh, and uh, her team uh, who uh, shared her their precious knowledge and experience with all of us today's lecture was full of knowledge and interesting things it gave some deep insights into the topic and also revealed some interesting facts we would also like to thank the government of madhya pradesh and the world monument fund for uh, undertaking this important restoration which surely will be a landmark of culture the city of indore will be proud of um i would also like to thank uh, um, prince yashwantra holkar and prince uh, richard Ra uh, richard holkar without whose presence this lecture was not possible lastly i would like to thank all the participants for taking out time from the busy schedule and attending this lecture thank you so much and uh, supriya if i may um throughout this time that we worked there i think it would be um appropriate if i would at least you know like to acknowledge also there's this team of uh, 15 16 um uh, gentlemen who've been and ladies who've been placed there by the government who are But, you know the day to day custodians of the place i mean they are ensuring that uh, that thing as as abba said that it's it's great that it's been kept as it is without interference so that you know things can be brought back to what they were earlier and they've been looking after it very lovingly that yes. i mean we we owe debt of gratitude to all these caretakers of the department okay. of archaeology they've really you know uh, looked after it with a lot of love and they know that place intimately so they know when a little thing is out of place they know it's out of place so they're a great asset also just just wanted to mention thank you supreme that's a wonderful wonderful note to end on because really it it does speak to how this palace um uh, can connect to people's hearts and and uh, the people of indore uh, will will look after it and um Uh, keep it alive and and vibrant for generations to come 
So thank you very much, everybody, for attending. And thank, thank you, uh, Abha and team, for sharing this.